been in a, a new series. We, we began this last week called In the Beginning. We're going to spend our time every Sunday in September talking about creation, what the Bible says, versus alternative views of what man says. This is the, the second part, and I, I want to use at least the first few minutes to go over the, the, the nuts and bolts of what we covered last week. So we'll start with this. There, there are pretty much three ways to look at how we got here. Pretty much three views on how we got here. The first one, biblical creation. God created man in present form within the last 10,000 years. That is biblical creation. That is a belief founded and grounded in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. A second view that many people hold, especially people who profess to have religious leanings and beliefs, theistic evolution, which is that man developed with God guiding. We got here because we have developed over eons and ages, but God has guided the process. Lastly is the view called evolution, which is that man developed, but God had no part in the process. Most who believe in evolution would also identify as being atheists. So on one end of the spectrum, you've got somebody like us who believes in the literal word of God. That what the Bible says it means. And what it means it says. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got people who don't believe in God at all and therefore could care less what your Bible says. They don't care. It don't mean anything to them. But you've got a group of people who, who want to take this one and this one and kind of pull them together so that they'll make sense. Let, let's take something from this one and something from this one and let's meet in the middle. And that's theistic evolution. But an easy breakdown of these three would be this. Biblical creation would be all God. All God. Theistic evolution would be some God. And evolution would be no God. I'm going to ask a question of each of these biblical creation and evolution. And I want you to see that the answer to the question is actually the same, which is this. How do we believe in biblical creation? How do we believe in biblical creation? The, the Bible actually answers that question well in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. I'd like for you to read this verse with me. The Bible says, By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Look at that verse. How do we believe in biblical creation? The answer is in the first two words. By faith. We believe in biblical creation by faith. You say, no, it's not faith. I know it happened. Well, let, let me ask you this. How, how many of you were there? Anybody there? No, you weren't there. How many of you know somebody that was there? Not Jesus. Somebody's learned that the correct answer in, in church is always either like God or Jesus or He loves us. You can answer like 90% of the questions you get asked in church with those three. But not this one. You don't know anybody that was there? You didn't have a grandparent or a great-grandparent or a great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparent that was there? You, you didn't see it. But yet you believe it. How do you believe it? By faith. The Bible says you believe it by faith. If you believe in biblical creation, you believe it by faith. What do we believe? It says we understand that the entire universe, that's everything, that the entire universe was formed, what? At God's command, His spoken word. 
that what we now see, creation, the universe, did not come from anything that can be seen. In other words, out of nothing, God spoke everything. Out of nothing at all, God spoke everything. I heard a story a few years ago that that there was a scientist and he was talking with a, a, a biblical creationist and he said, well, that's not that big a deal. I, I could do what God did. I, I, could, I could take dirt and, and the, the basic elements found in dirt are found in all of life over enough time. I could, I could create life out of this dirt. And the creationist looked at him and said, no, brother, that's not how it works. You've got to make your own dirt. You, you don't get to use his dirt. You've got to, you got to make something out of nothing. That's, that's what you and I believe in. Of course we believe it by faith. The, the, by the way, the same faith that I have, the measure of faith that I have to believe that Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again, by the way, I wasn't there and you weren't either. That's the same faith that I believe that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I, I, I'm applying my faith to all of Scripture, not just some of it. You, you have the same measure of faith, and you get to decide, am I, am I going to, pro, to lay out my faith just here, or am I going to uh, apply my faith throughout all of Scripture? The Christian should say yes. My, my faith for John 3.16 is also my faith for Genesis 1.1. Same question. How do others believe in evolution? We use scripture to answer our question, but let's allow Robert Jastow, who's a, a very well-known scientist and physicist from the 70s and 80s, to answer. He, he says this, evolutionist and renowned scientist Robert Jastow has conceded that belief in the accidental origin of life is an act of faith. Much, he says, like faith in the power of a supreme being. So even evolutionists who are honest will say, I wasn't there 15 billion years ago. I don't know anybody that was there 15 billion years ago. Therefore, by observation, they say, by observation, I believe that this is what happened. That is faith. I'm relying on something that I have not seen to define something that I now believe or see. That's faith. They put their faith in a theory, you and I have put our faith in the Bible, but it's still faith. Dr. Ben Carson, a lot of you are familiar with him. He was my pick, by the way. That's the guy I was going for a few years back. I don't know if you all remember that he ran for president. I really like that guy. I like everything about him, his story, his upbringing, his humility. But he is amazingly intellectual. I mean, this guy is smart. He's also a pediatric neurosurgeon. Developed some new ways to do surgery on the brain. All over the world, people know this guy, he's the real deal. Here's what he said. I, I think it takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in God. He, he obviously knows both sides of the story. Obviously, at some point in his, in his past, dealt with both sides and had to make a choice. Which one am I going to choose? And he says... To me, it felt like it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in God. That everything is just here by happenstance, just coincidence, just accidental. He said it takes more faith to believe that than that there's purpose. And there's a reason. There's a why. The question that a lot of Christians want to ask is, well, can I believe in both? As a Christian, can I believe in both God the Bible, and evolution. With that theistic evolution we talked about it a minute ago, that, that's where some people want to be given room uh, to exist. They, they want that space. They say, how about this? I, I, will, I will take your God and, and I will add my theory and we're going to just let them hang out together. Your God, he's got all of that ability. I believe in a God. 90% of people in America, 90% of United States adults believe in a supreme being. 
but half of that 90% believe in evolution. Some form of evolution, theistic evolution. They, they believe in it. So they want to put the two together. And the, and the question that you and I are going to talk about today is this. Can a Christian believe in both God, the Bible, and evolution? And what we're going to spend the rest of our time going through are seven contradictions between the two that proves that you can. Seven contradictions between evolution and biblical creation where they don't line up, where you can't take this one and this one and make it work. Where the, where the ingredients just won't mix. Oil and water, just not going to go together. The first contradiction that we'll look at is this. Where and when it all started. Where and when it all started. Biblical creation says that God created everything, both living and non-living material, from nothing. We read that verse a minute ago out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. That, that at His command, at His spoken word, the things that you and I see God made from something that did not exist. Out of nothing, God created everything. That's biblical creation's take on the where and when. Evolution says that 14 plus or minus billion years ago, the cosmos goes through a super fast inflation. You know what inflation is. Expanding from the size of one atom to that of a grapefruit. Now that doesn't seem like a big deal, but the difference between one atom and a grapefruit is nearly immeasurable. One atom expanded to the size of a grapefruit. And it happened in a tiny fraction of a second. That, that is the, the basic belief, the basic faith of an evolutionist. There, there was one atom. Of course, my first question would be, where would the atom come from? Just like my kids ask me, where would God come from? Right? I'd like to stump somebody else for a minute. One atom expanded in a, a fraction of a second. And that then if you go on and on and on, that happened and, and it was so hot that it then more or less bang. That's the big bang theory that after this inflation that something happened so terrific and the force from it actually scattered out the elements that would one day become our universe. About 14 billion years ago. Do you see that very quickly these two don't go together? You, you can't say that the Bible is true, that God created everything, both living and non-living material, out of nothing, and at the same time say, but there was a big bang 14 billion years ago. That's a contradiction. Those, those two won't go together. But let's look at another one. How about earth? How, how did earth come to be? Well, the biblical creation says this. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So Genesis 1-2 tells us that the earth was there at the very beginning and God made it. That He was over it. That, that what you and I now see to earth, that's not what was originally there. It's, it tells us that it was formless and, and empty. Almost like that, that wobbly water. That's, that's what it was. God's hovering over it. He's getting ready to do something magnificent. But the Bible says that earth came before day two, three, four, five, six, seven. An evolutionist says that throughout the last 13 billion years, as stars have died, heavy elements, the elements that were in the star. Because it dies, you see those shooting stars, that's the death of the star you're watching there. When, when that happens, heavy elements are dispersed into space. And over time, because of gravity, we all know what gravity is, over time, because of gravity, these elements eventually form new stars and planets, including Earth. So, so they say that several billion years ago, stars began to die. And then because those stars died, those elements, through gravity's actions were coalesced back together and they formed the other stars and solar systems and, and planets. That's how we say, that's how they say that the earth got here. But that raises another contradiction and that's the one between the biblical creationist view on our sun and all other stars and the evolutionist view on our sun and all other stars. Biblical creation 
which we'll take straight from Scripture in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 19, says this. Then God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth, and that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and evening passed and morning came, marking the what day? The Bible says that God created the sun, our sun, the moon, and all other stars on the fourth day. Now let's look at what the evolutionists say. They say that Earth is a product of stars that died billions of years ago. Only by chance did a planet form at this distance where we are from another star, our sun. And only by chance did this planet, our planet, have the necessary conditions for life as we know it. So evolution or theistic evolution, whichever you want to choose, says that the stars existed billions of years before earth. The Bible says that the earth existed days before the sun, moon, and all other stars. Now again, you get to decide which one you pick. Just know that you can't pick both because they don't match. You can't put these two together and say, well, I believe both. You either by faith believe the Bible or you by faith believe evolution. One or the other. Contradiction number four, where did life begin? Where did life begin? Biblical creation tells us that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, Then God said, Let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant, and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. Before we look at the next one, just know this. According to the Bible, life began on land. According to the Bible, what you and I just read, life began on land. Now let's look at the evolutionary theorists' answer to that question. Roughly 650 million years ago, during the late Proterozoic era, and yeah, I had to practice saying that, the first skeletal elements, soft-bodied metazoans, and animal traces began where? In the ocean. The first land animals evolved during the Devonian period 400 million years ago. So the evolutionist says that life began in the water and that it existed in the water nearly 250 million years before life existed on land. You cannot make the biblical account of creation and evolution's account of life meet. They're contradictory towards one another. You can't choose both. Let's look at the fifth contradiction. The plants and the sun. Biblical creation says that God created plants on day three. We just read that. And that the sun and all other stars were created on day four. We just read that. Evolution says that the first stars were formed one billion years after the Big Bang, about 13 billion years ago. And plants evolved much later. According to what we just read, evolutionists say that plant life evolved 650 million years ago. But stars were formed 13 billion years ago. Well, the Bible turns that around. Now get this. Here's one of the things that really struck me several years ago when I was studying through this. The Bible says that 
the day, the morning and evening is the first day, the second day, the third day. That, that Hebrew word there is called yom, Y-O-M. And when yom is connected to a number, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, when yom is connected to a number, 100% of the time in the Bible it's talking about a literal 24-hour period of time. Okay? When it's connected to a number. Now it's not like where, where it says back in our day, it's not connected to a 24-hour period of time. But when it says the first day, the second day, the third day, it always, over 300 times in the Old Testament, means a literal 24-hour period of time. If I apply that, that these aren't long days, billions of years days, but if I apply the 24-hour rule, which is the literal interpretation of Scripture, then I can quickly understand that plants could be created one day before the sun. It's no problem for me to imagine that plants can exist one day before the sun. When photosynthesis occurs and the plant retains its life and even flourishes and grows and bears other seeds, right? That's easy for me to say, well, if, if he created plants on day three and the sun on day four, they were fine. But I can't apply that to evolution. Because evolution says that the sun existed billions of years before the first plant line. You have to decide which one you believe. Can't be both. Let's look at the number six contradiction between the two concerning man. Now for both the sixth one and the seventh one, I want you to really, really pay attention because some of you aren't facts and figures kind of people, and I get that. Okay? So these, these last five didn't mean much to you, but six and seven will. Some of you are facts and figures kind of people. Just put up with me for another few minutes. Man. What is the view of man concerning biblical creation and evolution? Biblical creation says this. Then God said, let us, that us is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Very easily, we can sum up man with this statement. Man came from and was made in the image of God. The biblical definition of man is that he came from and is made in the image of God. Evolution says concerning man that during the last 2.6 million years, compared to these other numbers we've been throwing around, this is a very short amount of time. We went from 14 billion to 2.6 million. Isn't that amazing? During the last 2.6 million years, man has evolved from earlier mammals and primates. Man is no more than a step in an endless evolution. I want you to understand what this means, what the consequences are of evolution. When I read through and study all of the writings concerning evolution, their take on life, their take on the universe, their take on how we got to be here. And I get to the facts and figures of man. It breaks my heart. Because I see that someone striving to put their faith in evolution has allowed for their own life to have no meaning. Your own life as an evolutionist has zero meaning. You're not special. You're not valuable. You're not eternal. You're just a step in the process. Something better than you will take your place. Just give it time. Where is the hope? 
where is the purpose? If you take out all of the emotionalism of our faith, if you take out all of the spiritualism of our faith, I'll still pick it over that. I'd still pick it. Because at the very least, both myself and others would know that they have purpose and value. But an evolutionist, at his most honest, recognizes that man has need of it. They believe that everything, including themselves, is just a coincidence. And that when they die, they die. I, I can't have a part of it. And I can't, as a pastor, encourage or condone people in our church to go around thinking that they can meld those two ideologies together. Because those don't mix. They do not mix. Everything that the Bible says is about man and God. Everything that the Bible teaches is based on man and his relationship with God. Everything. You can't make that mix with an ideology that says man has no meaning. You can't put them together. You and I, by being biblical creationists, by believing that the Bible says what it means and means what it says, we allow others to have purpose and meaning and value. You are providing for them something that the scientific textbook will never give. Purpose and meaning. You and I are called to declare purpose and meaning. God loves you. God made you. God wants you. God gave His Son for you. God desires to save you and spend eternity with you. That is a compelling argument versus you're just another rung in the ladder. Which one do you think is more winsome and compelling? You and I are not using some of the greatest tools that we have to win others to Christ. Tell them that they have a choice. And here are their options. Let them know that there's no meat in the middle. There, there's no space for evolution that allows for God. That it's either all God or it's no God. And they get to choose which they Speaking of choice, our sixth contradiction is this. Seven. Death. Two very different views on death when you compare evolution and the Bible. The evolutionist says this. Death has occurred for the last one billion years. From the failings of the first stars to now, older, lesser, ill-equipped forms of life will perish as evolution marches forward. Death is simply a part of a process that cannot be stopped. Evolution says that from the death of the first star to now, it is unstoppable. Death is a part of evolution. It is built into evolution. For evolution to continue, there must be death. Other better organisms must survive and lesser organisms must die. That is evolution. But the Bible has a very different view of death. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. An evolutionist says death has always existed as a, as a part of evolution, a necessary step in the process. The Bible says that death did not exist until Adam 
sin. Those are two very, very different views. The Bible clearly says that when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, and Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. But the Bible gives us another passage concerning death that brings hope to us. And it comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Everyone is going to physically die. Because of sin and its consequences, we are all going to die. You cannot escape it. It is going to occur. But God has made a way for your physical death to only be a part of your eternal life. He has made a way for death to become nothing more than a door into a better new life. The Bible says that you and I cannot reverse the consequence of sin. It is death. But that God has made a way to circumnavigate, if you will, to do an end around death. Death is still going to occur for us, but God went from here to here with Jesus. He could not change Adam's choice. He gave Adam choice. Adam chose to sin, to disobey God. God doesn't reverse our decisions. He never will. But He makes a way. He's a way maker. He gave His Son to walk this earth apart from sin. When He injected Himself into humanity, He remained perfectly holy, perfectly righteous. And so then Christ died for every Adam. That's us. He died for every Adam. And not only in His death, but in His resurrection, He gave us an opportunity to have eternal life even after physical death. I share this with you because the greatest hope that you and I have is life after death. The greatest hope we have is life after death. There was a famous preacher that said several years ago, if the resurrection is not true, every Christian has wasted their life. If the resurrection that Christ defeated death and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, awaiting His command to return. If the resurrection is not true, then every Christian has wasted their life. Our hope is Christ. Our future is Christ. Our faith is Christ. Our purpose is Christ. Our life is Christ. You and I have that message to take to a world full of people who do not have hope because they do not have purpose, they do not have meaning, and they do not have value. This is the message that we take. The message of the Bible. That from the very beginning, it's been all God. We must win them. We must compel them. We must present truth to them. We cannot allow for our faith to be sidelined while science takes the stage. What they are proposing as science is foolishness. Foolishness. And you and I know that to be true. Why? Because the Bible says that God has put eternity in our hearts. Every man knows that he is meant for more. 
every man knows that eternity exists within him. Evolution is a lie created by who? Satan. Why? Because he seeks to steal and kill and destroy. Because he is a liar and the father of lies. And because if he can get man to worship creation, then he will not worship creation's maker. You and I are in a battle. The reason why these truths are being presented to you throughout these several Sundays is to equip you to battle well. Instead of saying, I don't know. Instead of saying, I've never thought about that. Instead of hoping that someone else can answer their question, you are being equipped to confront those who have been deceived. And you confront darkness with light and lies with truth. And you confront... Satan with our Savior.